you know that uh, churches were, in effect, public buildings. These were buildings which were sources of great pride for the citizens of Toronto and many other towns. Uh, there are boastings in the late uh, in the 1880s, 1890s, that there's 80 or 90 churches in the city of Toronto. It's a city of churches. But in that list of churches, invariably, uh, two churches on Jarvis Street come up. The first is Jarvis Street Baptist Church, uh, built in 1875 and uh, called in, uh, in an 1884 book, The Basilica of Baptists in Toronto. The Basilica of Baptists. And it becomes quite a center of music in its day, but it's a very important church. And it shows up in that steeple down the road. Uh, in between, um, in the 1870s, is Jarvis Collegiate, and then there is St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. That view, with those two steeples, is a historic and pretty critical view for the street of Jarvis Street. Uh, and if we're looking at a map from 1884, you can see Jarvis Collegiate uh, on the corner here, uh, sorry, Jarvis um, uh, Baptist Church, and up there is St. Andrew's, and there's Jarvis Collegiate in the middle. And Alan Gardens uh, in the heart. I wanted to show you this one as well, which I thought was fun. So this is Jarvis Street looking north past Queen Street in 1960. And if you look way up the street, there are the uh, two steeples again that become this landmark on Jarvis Street. So that cluster of those two steeples becomes uh, uh, very significant, I think, for the street. Um, St. Paul's Anglican Church, by the way, is also a, a family church for the street on North Street. Uh, education. Again, going back to that slide, there's Jarvis Collegiate, not on this site, but actually in what is now Allen Gardens, uh, where it was originally built in, uh, and completed in 1871, and called Toronto Collegiate Institute, because it was the only collegiate institute, and it becomes Jarvis Street after Parkdale Collegiate is born in 1890. It moves to this site in 1924. And then Havard, the Ladies College, and I don't have a good slide of it, but uh, if you know the former CBC studios uh, and now the renovated National Ballet, the red brick building on the south side of Northfield is the old Haverhill uh, uh, Ladies College. Started in 1894 and moves up to its current site in 1926. So two fairly prestigious Toronto education institutions which um, uh, have a long history on Java Street. And that sport, which I found interesting as I was digging around in this, I wasn't familiar with the Toronto lacrosse grounds on Wellesley, between Wellesley and Gloucester on Jarvis Street. Uh, and uh, the Toronto um, lacrosse grounds were uh, from about 1874 to about 1890. And from the book Toronto Past to Present 1884, this is what it says. The career of the Toronto lacrosse club, although not always uniformly successful, has been one of steady progress. From a very humble place in the game, they have risen to be one of its chief exponents, having beaten the most celebrated clubs in Canada and held at various times the championship of the world. In honor, they continue to hold at the present time. That's something worth exploring in terms of uh, the history of Jarvis Street as well. Um, and then we'll get into this development of the wealthiest states uh, on Jarvis. It's, uh, Jarvis Street develops relatively slowly. It's first set out in 1845, uh, and only, it's only over time that uh, some of the larger homes and estates uh, get to be built. Uh, Sir Oliver Mowat, on your left, uh, builds his house, Northfield, which is now a part of the National Ballet. Uh, it's that nice yellow brick Georgian building set back in the middle of all that glass. His house was built in 1856, and when he built it, he was effectively in the countryside. There was very little north of him or even around his house by 1856. It's Arthur McMaster then, who by 1878, uh, in, who entered a, a building uh, spree that starts out in the late 1870s and 1880s. And Arthur McMaster builds a house that still lives now. And that is, of course, the Craig Mansion, and that's as it looked in about 1920. Arthur McMaster, who's a uh, a nephew of William McMaster, the founder of McMaster University, again, big families, uh, built this house. The Massey family, Hart Massey, buys it in 1882 and they make it their own. Right now, all of this is effectively gone to the gas station, which you can see on that corner. They've got a lovely corner, which is to uh, include uh, a wonderful conservatory owned by the uh, Hart Massey. And then uh, in 1891, Chester Massey, the son of Hart, 
built his house next door, and he turned it into surviving buildings. So there it is today, and there it is in about uh, 1891, with the fence uh, and lots of tree cover to set back on the street. And then Walter Massey, another son of Hart, and a brother of Chester, built across the road. So there's an interesting history of family compounds almost, right? Uh, parents and, and uh, cousins and brothers uh, and sisters moving into a certain area as well, and that's certainly Jarvis Street on the top level. The competing family on Jarvis Street was the Cofra family, which was related to the Mullock family, uh, two very wealthy families as well in the day, and uh, that's looking up uh, Jarvis Street, and that's the Cofra house, which is now gone and placed by apartment buildings, which we'll get to. Uh, that house was built in 1884. And there, of course, is another surviving house, uh, the George Goodrum House. Uh, I believe George Goodrum, a son of the uh, distillery Goodrums, was 23 when he had this house built for him um, by the uh, uh, architect of the distillery, David Roberts. And there it is again in 1898, and uh, there it is today. It survived. And if you've ever been inside that in the restaurant, you can appreciate the absolutely beautiful interior of that house. Uh, it's amazing how well it's been preserved. These houses then are representative of that development of the Jarvis that I think is widely celebrated and remembered today, those great estates. Uh, Sir Joseph Flavel uh, was on the street in 1894. Um, and in 1884, another quote from Toronto Past and Present, which I think is interesting in some context. Of all the avenues extending south from Bloor Street to the Bay, noblest are Church, Jarvis, and Sherburn Streets. Church Street is less aristocratic, but has all the advantage of the magnificent church buildings in its course. Jarvis and Sherburn are lined on either side for the most part of their extent by the mansions of the Upper Ten. Of a summer, it is pleasant to saunter down one of these streets, while the thick verdure of the chestnut trees is fresh for the life of June, and the pink and white bunches of blossoms are as beautiful as any of the exotic flowers in the lawns and gardens of the houses. Uh, it is, in the 1880s and 1890s, a tourist site. This is where you must go. If you're visiting Toronto, you go see Jarvis Street, go see Allen Gardens, but then also check out Garden Street. And the golden age is from the 1880s to uh, World War I. But as we're talking about that, I want to bounce in Jarvis for a second. Remember, we're talking about a piece of Jarvis Street. Here's Jarvis Street looking north from the railway lines in 1930. So you get a very different sense of the bottom of Jarvis Street, certainly than it is today. Jarvis Street's a very, very good street. But it's, again, remembered largely for the wealthy residents is uh, up top. The families that built on Jarvis Street, are, I think, are worthy of thinking about and remembering, not just because of their grand homes here, but what they did elsewhere. So the, uh, the Masseys, of course, built Massey Hall, Hard House out of their funds, the Fred Victor Mission, uh, among others. The Cothras and the Mullocks, the Mullocks and Herrings of the Cothra Well, built the Royal Alex Theater. Uh, the Goodrums, of course, built the flat iron and contributed to the King Eddie, which would have happened, would have happened without them. And the Mullocks and Flavel, who also lived in Jarvis for a short time, were huge contributors to the Toronto General Hospital and College, which is now Mars. These were people with a great deal of wealth, but they were also great benefactors, and they left their mark around the city, far beyond Jarvis, in terms of the uh, structures that they built, at, uh, and uh, in some cases donated to the city. The beginning of the end for uh, Jarvis uh, comes in 1922 when uh, Coffer Mullock's house uh, is sold to uh, Dr. Bernardo's homes, and that's a home for destitute children. It's the beginning of the change in that this is the first shift in institutional uses of one of these grand estates. It's clear then that there are no private families, single families, who actually want to try to own and, and maintain that house anymore. The interest is shifting to uh, to non-private families and institutional uses. Uh, in uh, 1928, Euclid Hall, after uh, the last Massey uh, family member dies uh, in the house, uh, in 1928, becomes an art gallery. Uh, Sir William Mullet, Mullet remains on Jarvis Street until 1944, but when he dies, this house is purchased by the Salvation Army and becomes its headquarters. And the Globe and Mail says this in 1946. Uh, long past its prime and stripped of its youthful grandeur, Jarvis Street is in the process of losing one of its few remaining adornments, the tall, stately trees, which line the too narrow roadway. 
During the past two decades, Jarvis Street has been deserted by many of its old and respected residents, and its 13 licensed hotels, eight of them in one block, have spread its shady reputation as the uh, heart of the city's tenderloin district, far beyond the front of its borders, 1946. So what happens with those removal of the trees? This is where it gets uh, sad, of course, when we see these great trees come down. So this is 1947 in January. Uh, when they are widening the street, and there it is uh, in November of 1947. There's Jarvis Collegian. Uh, so there we are pre, and there we are post. So 1947 uh, is cutting down the trees. The Salvation Army acquires more land around the Cothra House, and by 1956 sells that land to an apartment developer. It buys the homes on that street. It buys one of the Gil Bernardo homes that you saw. It buys it in 1948 for $70,000, which is $20,000 less than it was bought for in 1920. So the real estate market, you understand today, just keeps going like this. The Croton and Jarvis Street, it didn't quite do that, and it actually went down. So they got those lots for a, uh, they bought a whole block for about $100,000, $100, and they sold it about eight years later for $585,000. So it tells you again, the value of those properties was not in the homes. The value was in the land. Get rid of those homes and look at that beautiful clear land that you have for apartment buildings. And the two 11-story apartment buildings were built on that site. And that's uh, one of them. Uh, this is looking at Jarvis and uh, Charles. And there's looking south on Bloor in 1960, south from Bloor in 1960. And we're looking at the apartment buildings down here. Um, Austin C. Thompson uh, wrote the book on Jarvis Street, From Triumph to Tragedy. And uh, it's a fabulous book, and I certainly used it for much of, uh, of what I've given you today. Uh, he closes with uh, reminiscing about uh, um, Bishop Cody, who lived on the street and was a director at St. Paul's Anglican. Before he left, he leaves in 1947, sells his house so that uh, Mount Pleasant could be extended. And uh, he says, before he left, he watched the great trees being cut down and other ones being vacant. And as he watched them die as they had lived with a quiet and noble dignity, somehow it seemed the street that had been, in been born in despair a hundred years before with the Jarvis family having to sell because of the uh, machine and uh, the financial crisis. The street had finally come full circle. So it had gone from tragedy to triumph, back to tragedy. He wrote the book in his I'm happy to say that things are changing, and this is one of the big bright spots, and that's why we're here tonight. So the, there has been uh, much change in Jarvis Street, certainly in the 1950s, but there are exciting times afoot in terms of the redevelopment of the street as well, which allow us to merge the new with the old, and, and that National Ballet School is one of the great examples on Jarvis Street today. Uh, two heritage buildings, the Haverhill College and Northfield, that have been incorporated and made new again. That's the excitement, and that's why we're here tonight as well. So I will put there.